Hey, it's Jim from Trek World. I want to take an opportunity today to do something I've never done before. We get questions, a lot of questions on the videos that we post in the comment sections and even in the YouTube community. So what I wanted to do is I've never done this before. I've gone back and I've grabbed some of the questions that have been fairly recent. So I'm going to go over a list of these questions. I'll end up putting them on the screen here in a few minutes as uh, we go through with it, but it'll give us some idea of how our viewers are interacting with us uh, and any questions that might have sparked thought that wouldn't necessarily show up anywhere else on the channel except in that comment. So the first one I want to talk about was GameSat left a question about a week or two ago. Great footage, he's referring to the 4K 60 frames per second blue screen footage. But why is 60 frames per second when we shot at 24? Can you upload a 4K 24 frames per second version? Yes, you were one of maybe two or three people who brought that forward. And I definitely saw what you guys were seeing. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to re-render that at 24 frames per second instead of 90 and put it up again as a second time for you guys to see it with as much natural fluidity as possible. I guess I was momentarily blinded by the, oh, everything's better in 4K 60 frames per second situation. And I've definitely found that some things do. For instance, when I upgraded the 4K 60 frames a second for the wonderful animation that Tobias Richter did for us, it looked incredible. But then again, it was a brand new state-of-the-art CGI rendering, whereas, of course, what we're dealing with with those film clips is, you know, 50-plus-year-old source film. So, yes, I will do that, GameSack. Thank you very much. Next, Michael Clifford was asking me a question on the evolution of the USS Enterprise. And this actually has come up numerous times. He says, the model, as it appears in the Smithsonian, has what appears to be some kind of energy weapon, perhaps a phaser emitter, on the bottom of the lower sensor dome. This isn't visible in the series, but the footage is too low of a resolution to tell. Is there evidence that it was actually part of the model when it was filmed? Uh, the short answer is yes, there is now. Uh, when they redid the Enterprise in 2016, that by that point they had found production photographs where you can clearly see it uh, on the model in some of the footage and pictures taken of the model while it was being filmed, it wasn't always very easily to be seen because, like you said, very low resolution. So they didn't include it because of the fact that there was no proof that it was there. Matt Bell. When you say junction box near the end of this really excellent video, thank you so much, Matt. He again is referring to also the evolution of the USS Enterprise. Do you mean the box with the various control switches on it? Because if so, I'm pretty sure I have a photo of that somewhere. Well, first off, Matt, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Matt did send me those photographs, and I've never seen them anywhere else. And I've been asked about this control box numerous times. Uh, Craig Thompson described it in all of his things that he did at the Huntington College. So several people have asked me what became of it. Does the Smithsonian have it? And the answer to the Smithsonian is, I honestly don't know. I might reach out maybe to Doug Drexler with this, especially now that I have a photograph of it and find out. Then I have another gentleman, and this was in response to the 4K 60 frames per second video. Uh, awesome video, very mesmerizing. Thank you so much, Christopher. Christopher Seeley sent this. I make collages and would love to send them to you. Do you have an email that I might send them to? I tried using the submit option you listed in the about section of this channel. No luck. And I'm really dying to see them. I love fan art like that. It's amazing what artistic people we have in, in our own fandom. You can send them to me at jim at trek-world.com. The submit.trek-world.com site is now working, but it wasn't working at the time that Christopher tried to get into this. Uh, I had gone in to do a little bit of house cleaning and ended up having to restructure some stuff. So I apologize for that. But you should be able to email me those so that I can take a look at them and be back in touch with you. I'm very interested to uh, find out more about how you got started in doing these kinds of things. Okay, so this next one is in relation to the same video, the 60 frame per second. Lance Hall submitted this. Question one, is it known if all of the raw FX shots are in the archives? No, it's not, unfortunately. There's probably stuff you and I haven't seen, and I have dug through a lot, as you can see. But I'm not really an expert on what's hiding. So I'm pretty good at ferreting out what's out there, even if it's stuck somewhere in a corner that nobody's remembered in years. But yeah, finding stuff that's not out there can be a little bit rough. So I think there is the possibility that there might be some footage 
that is owned by somebody and is kept in their private library, because I will tell you this, I've been in contact with photographers and collectors that have purchased photographs, negatives, and film frames and slides from the production people at Desilu, Howard Anderson, uh, and Paramount over the years. And they very much consider those pieces now, those images now to be under their domain. The law actually says that buying that stuff doesn't give you the exclusive right. It gives you a non-exclusive right. However, some people do buy an exclusive and they have the little paper that they can whip out. Uh, but I don't play that game. If you really want me to take it off, I'll take it off because this is supposed to be one big happy family. So I would bet that, yeah, there could be some footage that's being hidden somewhere. You know, and then there's two. Why did the people who did the HD syndication, uh, why didn't they scan these and use them as basis for new composites? Why did they go through all the trouble of creating new CGI shots? Okay, so to really answer this question, you got to roll yourself back in time. We got to go back to 2000. There was a grassroots movement in the internet in the early 2000s to do CGI upgrades on Star Trek. There was a gentleman, his videos are probably still here on YouTube somewhere, did a series of CGI updates on the Doomsday Machine. He said, hey, this is, consider this a resume, a portfolio. This is what I can do. Do was absolutely amazing. We looked at the renders and we looked at the screen footage and went, wow, this thing actually now looks like it belongs in our time frame. 20 years ago. So there was a big push back then to go digital. And I think that the decision was made to do the complete, complete remasters with CGI footage because it's not just, it was not just about replacing the footage. It was about doing things that couldn't have been done in the original series. For instance, the, the Klingon ship being used for both Klingon and Romulans in several episodes including uh, The Trouble with Dribbles, I believe, I could be wrong, there's a lot of this stuff rattling around in my head. When I come across in my videos, I come across, I come across this very authoritative. That's because I study a lot and I have notes. Um, but I believe that perfect example is um, the use of the Klingon ships in The Trouble with Dribbles. They didn't have the money to film them and they didn't have them yet uh, built. So uh, they used stock footage where they could. And then they just talked about Klingons but we never saw their ships. So when it came time to redo the HD uh, versions, they took that opportunity to correct those things, to make footage that they would have liked to have believed we would have done in the 60s. So I understand exactly why they do it. I understand what their pressures were. And more importantly, I understand why people today are uncomfortable with it. Because the reality of the situation is, it's been 20 years. The rendered shots of the Enterprise the effects that they had back in the early 2000s were pretty great at the time. They don't hold a candle, however, though, to the render that I just got from Tobias. Okay, The fact of the matter is the state of the art on CGI has moved so much in the past 20 years that it's a joke when you look at something 20 years ago to, to try to explain it as being CGI. Because your young children and stuff look at go, that looks more like a cartoon that has been computerized over. Um, we have the ability to do that much better now. Will they do it again? I don't know. I don't know if there's any money in that, to be perfectly honest. Don't forget, Star Trek is a cash cow. Still is. Uh, but there's limited resources that they have. Well, there's still so much they have left to do on restorations and enhancements, say, for Deep Space Nine, which I would love to see. So, sorry that went on a little longer than I wanted, but yes, they would. They, they did that because they know they needed to in order to be marketable. Also, it was about all about HDTV. I will have a video on this. I actually have the first few minutes of the video already planned out. The HDTV thing is a very, very important driver of what they did. Next up, about a month ago, it was from my buddy Tim Koss. Tim, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, as most of you probably learned. I'm not the best pronunciation person in the world, okay? I have a great question about 11-foot-long Enterprise. Did the Smithsonian Institute hold onto the wiring and original lights from before the LED upgrade? Are they going to plan, they plan to display this too? So I reached out to Doug Drexler and I asked him, and he said, yes, they have everything that's ever been removed from the model, you know, going back to whenever, you know, when... Uh, Edmir Recchi did his, the re restoration was done in the 80s, they have everything. Um, it's part of their library policy. Um, there are no plans to display it that I'm aware of. Now, they might change their mind, but let's face it, 
they did that whole exhibition in 92. They never displayed it in the interim. So I don't really see that it's something that they believe would have value in showing to museum goers. But rest assured, it is there. Nothing is being thrown away. The next one comes in a follow-up, believe it or not, to whatever happened to the Galileo shuttlecraft from Star Trek. Uh, and it's from Bulldog TV. Is there any kind of estimate as to how much of the Galileo is now the original materials? Obviously, big chunks have been replaced and refurbished over the years. How much of the original wood and metal is still part of the shuttle? Well, I can tell you, none of the original wood is there. It's all gone. Uh, for obvious reasons over the decades of being exposed and, and put out, you know, to pasture, literally. Um, the metal that is left, the entire bottom part of the Galileo, from the wings down, is a metal superstructure. That's all still there. The skeleton is still there. The landing pad is still there. They're the only original pieces. Uh, so this is the ship of thesis situation. Or as where I grew up and several people mentioned me from Virginia, this is the grandfather's axe thing. You know, your grandfather gives your father his axe because it's an heirloom. And your father goes, oh, well, you know, but the, the, the handle was rotted. So I had to replace the handle. And then he gives it to you. And then you're looking at it and you go, okay. And he tells you, this is my father's axe. This is your grandfather's axe. And you look at the axe and it's got a nice shiny handle. Uh, but the, the head looks terrible. It's had the living daylights be done. So you go and you replace the head. So how much of that is actually your grandfather's axe? None, because two pieces have been changed. None of the original things are there. Um, but in this case, for, this, for the Galileo, yes, the metal superstructure is still intact. So they didn't lose everything. And this one comes from Alan, a.k.a. Rocket Man. Uh, and it has to do with the visual effects replacements that were done where I showed you the original optical effects and the effects in in CGI that were used to replace them. And he asked, were the planets shown in TOS just rotating spherical models or something more? And they looked quite realistically at the time. Yes, they did. They looked very realistic. And yes, they were just photographed spherical models. I have actually found a photograph of one of them that was shown in, uh, it might have to be one of the clapboard shots. I'm not sure. I'd like to work it into a video at some point. Yes, they did. There was more than one. I want to say there was maybe five. Um, but I need to do a little more research on that. But I went looking for and found the first planet solely because of your question. So thank you very much. It had never occurred to me. And it's finding out little stuff like this that just makes this so much fun. And then during the, uh, the post that I put on the community board about how the original big three was not Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It was actually Kirk, Spock, and Janice. And I put a photograph up there. And Manly Stranger, who's a good viewer of eyes, has been around for a while. So Grace is lovely in this publicity photo, but what are they holding in their hands? Flashlights? Are they guiding in a plane on a runway? Or were these the first props as phasers? Isn't it weird that Kirk and Spock are wearing uniforms that don't quite match? So yes, um, first off, uh, the flashlights were there because that particular day, they didn't have any of the real hand weapons available. There were quite a few photographs taken at the beginning of Where No Man Has Gone Before, where they had Kurt, Spock, and Rand handling, you know, flashlights uh, and other electronic pieces that were supposed to look futuristic and didn't. This, I actually believe this particular picture is actually mentioned and discussed in her autobiography, which I have bought and I hope to be reading soon. And I'll give you more information on it. And then uh, from Carl Kingry, we're we going to go back to the Galileo history you had started. Yes, Carl, I am going to be going back. Um, I needed to change gears just a little bit because people were asking for something other than the, what, three or four Galileo videos I've done so far, but I have two more left. I've got the Lynn Wheeler years, and then the years that ended up with Adam Schneider and where it is now. Um, you'll probably see the next one, the Lynn Miller years, in about a month or so. I have two other videos in front of it before I can start back up in it again. But yes, I am not done with the Galileo. And this next question came in under the video that I had originally for raw studio footage of Star Trek Enterprise. And his name is uh, Peter Harold Janik. So I'm a tad confused. The Restored Enterprise has a thin but definitive blue area on the forward portion of the neck between the two holes. We never see this in production. I think you said in this very video, is it was there and they removed it for production. Is that right? It was there and it was much more prominent in the cage. Uh, they uh, toned it down quite a bit in Where No Man's Gone Before. And I believe they toned it down again 
in the uh, series because they were using a blue screen background. So yeah, it's there, but it virtually disappeared as the years went on uh, for obvious reasons, because it really wasn't gonna work with blue screen. Remember the very first time they shot Enterprise, they shot against the black screen. So they didn't really think all that much about what would happen if you tried to shoot it in front of a blue screen with that paint job on it. And that's it. Uh, so thank you for your time. Uh, I will get back to you going to work. Remember that we are still doing the giveaway at uh, 11,000 subscribers. There's a video that I'm making an announcement on. You should see it up here somewhere, hopefully, um, where I talk about the 11,000 subscriber mark and we're at like 10.4, I think right now. I have a complete set of the original Star Trek poster magazines, all 18, including the very rare uh, issue that was printed a couple years afterwards in celebration of uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture. So anyhow, sorry about the mistakes in this, guys, but this is really stream of consciousness and I take time to edit it a lot. Uh, I'll never get it on the site. And I really wanted to be this more of an informal discussion between friends. So thank you for your time. I look forward to talking to you again. You should see the James Bush series very soon now. Maybe a little more than a week off. Thank you.